morning and welcome to the Great Hills Moravian Church on this 16th Sunday after Pentecost. We have a few announcements. Number one, <clears throat> there's a rose on the altar to celebrate the birth of Bonnie and Mike's niece's, niece Ashley's baby girl named Olivia Annalise Cantarina. Number two, we, after the service, we will be celebrating the 90th birthday of Sister Joan Cutting. Please join us for the fellowship hour. Three, there is an, a sign up sheet to join the team of ushers in the North X. Our watchword of the week is bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits from Psalm 103, verse two. Our call to worship is responsive. Please stand if able. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will, he will not, not always strive with us, nor will, will he keep his anger, his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punishes us according to our iniquities. As for the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Good morning, brothers and sisters. We have two things we'll be doing today. First thing, as you notice, we have some food items here, which today is the Moravian Day of Service. And we, all the congregations in the district and the province are encouraged to have something, some community outreach um, event. So here at Great Kills, we are collecting some food items. The information is in your bulletin on the blue sheet. So to start this day of giving, I would like to do a blessings for the donations that um, we all will be participating in. Let us pray. Our giving to others is a part of the hallelujahs that we sing to you, O oh Lord. It forms a part of the way that we praise your holy name because we know that all that we have come from you. We joyfully ask that you bless these gifts that we are given to those who are in need. We understand that you have instructed us to feed the hungry and care for the needy. We accept and live into that challenge. In gratitude for how you have blessed us, we give back a part as a way to follow your mandate. We thank you that we are able to give back a portion of what you have so graciously given to us so that we may continue to build your kingdom. Bless those who give and bless those who receive, and may we always extend to those who are in need. Amen. Our second prayer is for our sister Joan, who, as we said, her birthday is today. So. For those years, I would like to extend um, happy birthday to you and extend a prayer so that we all may join in. And then we will sing the birthday hymn 447. We thank you, O oh God, for the life and the witness of our sister. We know but for your grace that she is here with us. We ask that you continue to bless her and her family and watch over her all the days of her life. And Sister Joan, may she, may she continue to know your peace and strength in her life. Sister, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Jesus, amen. And please turn to 447 as we sing the birthday hymn.
God continue to bless you. Blessings to you. We'll have our gathering hymn now, 785, where charity and love prevail. <laughs> Stand and if you're able, as we pray the liturgy of grace found on page 31, if you're using the book of worship. We worship you, Lord God, the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. You dwell in the high and holy place, and also with those who are contrite and humble in spirit. Give, Give us grace to bring you the sacrifice of a broken and contrite heart, which you, O oh God, will not despise. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making you wise the simple. A date than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. God spoke these words, saying, You shall have no other gods besides me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Maybe seated. 
Lord God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keep in steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the unrepentant. Incline your ear and hear, for we do not present our supplications before you on the ground of our righteousness, but on the ground of your great mercies. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Do not cast us away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, and sustain in us a willing spirit. Have mercy upon us according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out our transgressions through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thus says the Lord, I will forgive your iniquity and remember your sins no more. Peace be with you. of God, let us join in professing our faith. With the whole of Christendom, we share faith in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe and confess that God has revealed himself once for all in Jesus Christ, that our Lord has redeemed us with the whole of humanity by his death and resurrection and that there is no salvation apart from him. We believe that Christ is present with us in the word and the sacrament, that he directs us through the Holy Spirit, thus calls us into a church. We hear him summoning us to follow him and ask him to use us in his service. Christ joins us together mutually so that knowing ourselves to be members of his body, we become willing to serve each other. In this spirit, we await the appearing of Jesus Christ, go forward to meet our Lord with joy, and pray to be found ready when he comes. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. 
Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time to make our common intercession to you. And you have promised through your beloved son that where two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O oh Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. gifts to God. together recite the prayer of blessings. Lord God, Lord God we, accept we accept the grace that, that you have given us, and, and we pray that we can extend grace to others. We pray to be worthy of all the goodness that you have shown us. We strive, dear Lord, to be what you want us to be. Bless us and these gifts that we give back in gratitude. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. Joseph reassures his brothers. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, 
They said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Our second scripture reading is from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. I will read it responsibly. Accept the one whose faith is weak without passing judgment on, on disputable, disputable manners. One man's faith allows him to eat anything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in their own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord, for he gives thanks to the Lord. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and give <laughs> thanks to the Lord. Sorry about that. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Our gospel lesson comes to us from Matthew chapter 18, reading verses 21 through 35. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused, instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. 
When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray, and this is the prayer from our daily text for today. Most loving God, the certainty of your blessing is eternal, everlasting from generation to generation. We are grateful and humbled that it is you in whom we live, move, and have our being today. Amen. Forgiveness has no bounds. I lead off with this today because some of us may at times have difficulty forgiving someone who has done something wrong to us. We say this right off because this is the basis of our lesson today. This is the point that our scripture focuses on for today. There are people who find it so hard to forgive and move on. There are siblings who go years without speaking. I have watched movies where children do not speak to their parents and vice versa. What could be so bad that we cannot forgive? Especially someone who we should be close to as family. What is forgiveness? And how should we? Especially we who claim to be God people, Christ people, how can we live in, into it? How should we live into it? How do we live into it? It may be different, different things to different people, but we must first understand just what it is and what it entails. When someone does something wrong, something that is against what God expects, we find it hard to get past it. We become broken people in a broken world. It hinders us because we do not give grace as God gives us grace. Physical, physical, <clears throat> physical or emotional, emotionally injuring, hurting someone speaking ill of and to someone. These are when relationships are broken because of someone being wronged and we do not do anything about it. We don't see it as it is. So any wrong, and we all I think know what wrong is. Any wrong that is done, there are things that these are things that would require forgiveness because these are things that dig deep into our souls and make it quite difficult to move past them. However, we are called by God to repair relationships, to build each other up as people of God. We spoke about that last week. Even if these offenses are repeated, we are called by Christ not to be vengeful, not to retaliate, not to keep them in our hearts. When someone is hurtful towards us, we cannot harbor unforgiveness towards them because this demonstrates that we are not following what God wants from us. And there are consequences, as we saw in scripture, if we fail to forgive. This term of forgiveness is not an abstract idea. 
It's not something that is above the level, our level of understanding. I think we all know what that means deep down, even mentally. Even in our minds, we know what forgiveness is and what it entails. It seems to be cut and dry according to the parable in which Jesus spoke, where we should strive for God's standards instead of the standards of the world, and we should apply it. The example that Jesus gave in the parable gives us the teaching from the Father on why we should forgive. The king, the king represents God and his infinite grace to give mercy and forgiveness. As an example, this is an example to show grace to our fellow brothers and sisters. Much is required, much is required of us as children of the Most High. If we want forgiveness, if we want to be forgiven, and I, Im and I imagine that most of us do, we must forgive. The king, the king was merciful and he canceled the debt. The servants, number one and number two, are us, the people. One is forgiven and the other does not forgive. There are many instances in scripture which speak about forgiveness. In Genesis, as we heard in our reading, Joseph forgave his brothers for what they had done to him and he provided for them forgiveness. Isaiah talks about how displeased God was when he forgave his people and they did not reciprocate to others by holding grudges and harboring ill feelings against them. God keeps no record of the wrong that we do. And in 1 John, we are told that if we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we understand these things, we will be more forgiven. One writer, Brian McGill, wrote that there is no love without forgiving and no forgiveness without love. That love must be there for us to even begin to move towards grace to our brothers and sisters. This takes us back to what we spoke about last week. This is reinforcement on church discipline and reconciliation because in that same scripture, Jesus took it a little further when Peter wanted clarification on forgiveness. He wanted this because Judaism, in Judaism, it tells them to forgive three times. So Peter wanted to hear what Jesus, his teacher, had to say about it. We have all been, I believe, in situations where we seek pardon or we must give it to someone. Sometimes it can be difficult to look past our feelings to get to the peace that comes after forgiveness. The main point, the main ingredient, the task is to let go. Let go of the anger and the hurt and the wronged. Often when we feel betrayed or hurt, we may vow never to forgive the person who has done us wrong. Is this an unforgiven spirit? Is it? I would say no. I would say no, it's not. It is an unforgiven spirit. When we hold on to things that hurt us, it does nothing but drain us. When we dwell on past offenses and mistakes, it depletes our spirit. It doesn't leave us. It's always there in our minds. And some may say, I will forgive but not forget. When we say that, to me, it means that it still, it still festers 
with the potential to rise up at any given time. So asking God to help us set things right in our minds, to find it in our hearts to forgive and placing it behind us go a long way for healing, peace, and restoration. This brings up the question that Peter asked, how many times should we forgive? Peter mentioned seven as a number, and I guess that seemed reasonable to him. He's going away above what he, what he learned, what he knows. He asked this question probably thinking it's only logical that there's a limit. There's a limit to forgiveness. He probably thought that he was being gracious by offering the number more than the norm. But much more is required. However, Jesus gave a larger number, a larger number to infer that forgiving someone is limitless. I don't know about anyone else. But if someone hurts me, if I cannot address it and put it to rest, it will continue to pop up. And that's quite bothersome. I can't spend the time and the energy worrying about it. So I do my best to let it go. Let it go for our own inner peace. Did Jesus give this number? because he knew that we most likely cannot and would not keep track of it? Or did he give this number 77 times, indicating that it would be more difficult to keep track if we were inclined to do so? The point, the point is not to keep count but always willing to place our hearts in a place to forgive. There is never any hopeless predicament. And there's a penalty, a penalty for not forgiving, for not showing mercy. Jesus's answer demonstrates how God forgives us. God does not keep count or give us a limit. No matter how much we mess up or sin, God forgives us every time. If our forgiveness should be, our forgiveness should be in direct proportion to the incredible amount of times that we have been forgiven by God. With this, we must always be willing to have compassion in comparison to how God operates. Colossians explain, explains why, Christ, why, why Christians are called to forgive at all times. Because God sent Jesus to give us that grace. And he's not asking us to do something that he hasn't done time and time again. We are called to emulate this. And the main point is that God gave us his son, the Christ, to provide for our remission of sin. That is grace. We did nothing to deserve it. Absolution of all the sins that we commit, we are forgiven. So Jesus's answer, demonstrate how God forgives us. The parable of the unforgiven servant is to teach us that just as God forgives us, we too must forgive as many times as necessary. When Jesus was on the cross, 
the first statement he made was calling on God the Father to forgive those who placed him there. Jesus' words from the cross echo his answer to Peter's question. Forgiveness has no bounds. Amen. Our hymn of response, 783, Amazing Grace. Receive the benediction. Dear God, forgive our trespasses as you have forgiven our trespasses. Go in peace, dear brothers and sisters, and let God guide you into showing grace and mercy to all that you have encountered. Because just as God loves us, so you should love each other. Amen. We continue with our God in Him.